open, open your Bible if you have one. Find the Gospel of John. Uh, goodness, this probably can go a hundred different directions, and hopefully we'll be able to direct it in some way. That makes a lot of sense. John chapter six. Just find this, and uh, this this is uh, at, like as the world turns, so it continues to be controversial. <laughs> Paradoxical. I mean, that's the way the truth is. It, it, uh, the truth is just that way. And so, uh, I'm sure all of you have probably heard this passage of Scripture, but you probably haven't heard it the way I'm fixing to say it. Okay. That's just most likely. John chapter 6, verse 44. John 6, 44. It says, uh, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. Now we were going to put that nobody can come to the altar unless we have barbecue and beer. And then that just draw them all. <laughs> that, draw them, see? <laughs> that just draws everybody. But now notice that. It says, no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. Now the word draw, I just want you to hear this word. The word actually is hell kuo, hell kuo. And actually the word means drag. That's, it doesn't mean, you know, you read that draw and automatically you put woo and God just will please come, won't you please come. One more time, we're gonna just sing it one more time. Please come, y'all, that's how you see that. Huh? But it doesn't say that, it says nobody comes unless they're drunk. And that don't mean drugged. It means unless they are oh, drugged. Because right. every person, no matter who you are, you come kicking and screaming. And all the time, the Spirit is drawing or dragging us, literally. And the reason for that is spiritual truth is just like food. It's something that needs to be consumed. But we never consume it. We have been taught about religion We've taught, been taught to go to church. We've been taught to study Bible stories at Sunday school. We've been taught all this thing, but it was religion. It wasn't spiritual truth. We didn't grow up with spiritual truth. I don't know anybody, really, that grew up with spiritual truth, but it's the spirit and the truth that really makes us free. Otherwise, we come kicking and screaming, every one of us, no matter who we are. So I wanted to just emphasize that passage of Scripture, no man comes to me unless the Spirit drag him. And that's the, and you can look it up if you want to. I, actually, it's the Greek word, if you look in Strong 1670. Just look it up and, and you'll see it. And it says that <laughs> very clearly, unless you're drug. And every one of us, have, have y'all been drug here this morning? Probably, you know, now you're not kicking and screaming, but I don't want to go. I don't feel like going. I mean, yeah, I, I, it's, I mean, we all can associate with that if uh, if we think about it. Well, your critical moments in life is often when you take the biggest steps. I mean, I can speak for me. It was when things were rock bottom shortly after the dessert, the, the divorce. Mm -hmm. Came to Lynn and yeah. said, what do I do? You introduced me to Wayne way back then. Mm -hmm. Two years later, I came to you and George and said, it's time for me to come home. What are we going to do? Right. Um, but yeah, I was kicking the screen. I was rock bottom. I had to, something's got to happen one way or the other. Well, you know. And isn't that one, for, for so many of us, isn't that when the real turning points come? Exactly. Good or bad? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we have been fighting that that's been dragging us along. And we, I, I mean, that's a common thing. It's not a put down. I don't see it at, at all as a put down. Mm -hmm. I see it as. Uh, we fight it different ways. And, and I'm saying because the re only reason we do is we have, <coughs> not, we have not been taught the spiritual truth from our infancy. And so what happens as infants, we are, um, I, I get, I, well, for lack of a word, we are all spoiled brats and still have that childish infant. Well, I don't want to do it. I ain't. No. Have you ever heard a kid tell his mom, no, I don't know, but that wouldn't happen in my house. Anyway, that uh, happens to all of us. So I want to read you this note. In every life, all of humanity is on its journey toward enlightenment. 
not knowing that we all are being drawn or as we just seen here drug by that which we are taught to call God or Father now this is a, this is a real catchy term and again I'm I'm really doing a bunch of study and research on the term God, the term Father, and then of course if you get outside of the mainstream Christianity, then that, that name changes. It's called essence, it's called power, it's called a lot of different yeah, things you, other you than know, trying to give it a personal pronoun to make it human, which is, which is good because God is not human. And, but yet it's hard for us to see that. We can't hardly see God without seeing human. Father, in our eyes, we associate it with most likely our father or our idea of a father. So when we say, my father God, we humanize that. God is not human. And he doesn't have human attributes. That's difficult for anybody to assimilate because we have never been taught that. We don't think that way. So when you read in Genesis 1 and all you read about is Elohim, you're not reading about a father figure. You're not reading about our idea through religion as a God human figure. You're reading about the astrological wheel and the 12 signs of the zodiac. Now put that in your pipe and try to humanize that because you can't. Even though everything that makes you human comes from that. And so that's hard. So that is when, you, when you read and you see those things, God is all and in all. When you read things like that and we try to humanize it, then we put attributes on this human figure not knowing it doesn't have those attributes. That's a difficult pill to swallow. And I know that more than as much as more, more than anybody. Nevertheless, it's something that I'm just really like needing, working, squeezing, searching, and hearing things. So, which we are taught to call God Father. The closer we get toward enlightenment, which is nothing but awakening, that's what enlightenment is, the more the, the Spirit, the Source, God, Father, whatever names you're thinking, drags you, the closer you, He drags you, the more you become awake, and the more you become enlightened because it, God is light. So we, we have to remember that. The closer we get toward enlightenment or awakening, the more we realize that all of the pain, which we associate as evil or sin, which is a, a poor association with it because generally really what it is is pain. And it's the kind of pain like a gut pain, not necessarily just a physical pain where you or your leg hurts or your arm hurts or whatever. It's a more of a gut pain. It's, a, it's something that's deeper than that that you just, uh, you got hurt and you say, oh, it hurts, it's pain. It's a pain that's deep, it's something that's deep in all of us, you, all of humanity. And it's called pain. It's not evil and it's not sin in our concept of evil and sin. Because religion, again, has taught us the concepts that we mostly embrace. So the closer we get to enlightenment, the more we realize that all of the pain and the transgression, and the word transgression just simply means you veer off the path. And if you're like me, we used to go hiking a lot. Me and the girls, I used to take the girls into the mountains and we go hiking a lot on a lot of the trails. And it's real easy for you to veer off because you see something over here, it looks, you know, a flower, a tree, a bird or whatever. A, a brook a, a, and you go over there to check it out it wasn't wrong for you to do it it wasn't bad for you to do it but that word veer off the path got translated transgression and then when religion got a hold of transgression they made it sound horrible oh you have transgressed God and it was God the one that put the flower over there the brook over there to lead you off that path but no, I mean, you know, we, so we hear that. So that's when you hear the word track, it just simply means you veered off the path. It doesn't mean you've lost the path. It doesn't mean you ain't ever going to get back on the path. It don't mean you're going to hell burning, kicking, and screaming. <laughs> it don't mean any of that. It just simply means you just stepped aside. That's all. You just stepped to the side. And so you veered from the path. We call it wrongdoing. 
And it's the results of our own ignorance. Usually, that's all it is. The results of ignorance. And ignorance just simply means I just don't know all of the facts. I just don't know all of the information. And how many of you would honestly admit you don't know all the information that you could know? So in essence, that makes us ignorant. I'm first to admit it. I know there's so much that I'm ignorant about, but I don't want to be ignorant. I would like to know. So I'm trying to get in the path to know. I want to know. I'm curious and I want to know. I don't want to be ignorant. So that's all it means. It just means not knowing what or how to do what you're doing. And if you're a researcher or if you're really hungry and you don't know what you're doing, most of you are going to Google it. <laughs> or you're going to get a book or you're going to try to find something to help you find what to do and how to do it, right? Hello, say amen. amen. <laughs> I know you do that. Uh, not knowing what to do or how to do it. Not being taught the rules of the game of, of lives. Let me just uh, let me put this up here because this is going to be important. I'm not really sure how to spell it, to be honest with you. L I V E S. I'm thinking because I'm talking about more than life. I don't want to just say life. I want to say lives. You're not living your life. You're living your lives. L I V E S. And you don't know it. Because we're ignorant. Nobody's ever told me that I'm living life. More than one life? Yeah. More than one life? Yes. And so how could that possibly be? I thought I was just living this life. Well, that's one of our great problems where we're ignorant. We don't realize we're living lives. And Scripture teaches us that. Is it, I, I mean, I'll show you a passage in a few minutes, I hope. Try to get to it. And it's just there. It always has been there. And actually, I've even preached on it 25 or 30 years ago. And so I something brought me back to it to revisit it for just a moment. Not being taught the rule of the games called lives, L-I-V-E-S, two lives or more, or the moves and the dance of lives. Ignorance keeps us in conflict, keeps us in battle, thinking we have to win the battle, we have to defeat the enemy, in other words, the devil. Is that not a common term? I mean, you could go to any Christian, and I will guarantee today they've been fighting the devil, and I don't care what today today is for them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they fought the devil all day yesterday, fight the devil all day today, and tomorrow they'll be fighting the devil all get, uh, tomorrow. So their life is consumed in fighting the devil mm -hmm. because Christianity has made something out of something that ain't something. <laughs> it's a mess. <laughs> I mean, it's truly a mess. If you just step back and take the time to think about it and look at it, it's really a mess. So ignorance keeps us in conflict, battle, thinking we have to win this battle and defeat the devil, which is the enemy, Satan, Lucifer, that old servant. Hmm? When in fact, that which we are taught to call our enemy are, listen to this, are obstacles. Many times, obstacles placed there by our source. Or by ourself. And why are they there? I will tell you why they're there. They are there to redirect you to the path. They are there to strengthen you in the path. They are not accidents. They are not problems. They are situations that are always placed there to give us a direction. So, which in fact we are taught to call our enemy or obstacles to help teach us to learn the rules of the games of lives. So, there's that. <laughs> so I want to read you something else here. These things. Uh, the mystery of water. I'm going to talk some about that this morning. The mystery of water is one of the greatest mysteries in all of Scripture. And I'll show you that in names that you never dreamed that that name basically was about water. No matter, I'll show you. The mystery of water is one of the greatest <laughs> mysteries in all of Scripture, yet could be the most misunderstood subject in all of Scripture. The story of Moses, even the Hebrew spelling of Moses' name. Well, let me just go ahead and put this one up here. Moses' name, because I will come back to this. That's Mim. 40, Sheen, 300, and Hay, 5, which actually has a 345 value. 
which actually has a value of 12 or 3. And when you have the 3, that's the, that's the Gimiel in Hebrew, the 3 actually means the one source, we call that God, the one has split itself to become the two, which is the Beth, which means container or house, and then moved into it, which is the Gimiel, which is a threefold, threefold cord that can't be broken. So it actually means that you are actually three in one. Okay, mm -hmm. that, that's, that's what. So when you see that value or that particular glyph three, that you have to remember, it's talking about me. It's talking about me, but I'm not alone here. Because there's something between my male and my female, and it's that and. And that and happens to be the source that pulls both together. That's the marriage that can never be broken by man, period. It's the marriage of the spirit or God or source, whatever, into the human carcass called the physical body. So this is the word Moses. It's called Moshe. And actually, the name Moshe actually simply means be drawn out of water. So you have to think about that. So Moses' is name, and you'll have to remember, wasn't that's, it wasn't how we were introduced to the story of Moses. Remember, Moses was put in a little basket and put in the river and floating down the river, and then uh, the Pharaoh's wife found him. Remember the story? Yeah, kind of, oh, yeah. yeah. and ha what happened? She drew him up out of the water. So is the story of Moses. So all of his story is allegorical. It's not historical. It's not about a history of some woman that actually put her baby in a basket and said, oh, I hope you're going to be okay, and push you off down the river. I hope the sharks, the alligators ain't going to eat. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, surely you thought that. I, I mean, that's not a very good moment to do that, is it? It's an allegorical story. It's about you being released. It's about you, God, releasing you. But you're not alone. And that's the thing that we have to realize. We're being drugged to where we need to go. So, it could be the most misunderstood subject in all of Scripture. The story of Moses which is the, like I put on the board there, the Hebrew spelling means to be drawn up out of water, is a story about the mystery of water. The Hebrew, well, I might as well go ahead and put this one up too. Alif. Dalit. Mim. This one is called Adam. That's not the story of a man that you and me know of as Adam, and I, I eat Adam and Eve. It's not. It's something different from that. And once you start to see that, then you'll say, oh, okay, so the story of Adam is not the story of a man that was the first one that God created, and he's the father of all of us. Not that at all. And uh, the story of, uh, let me do this, Alif, Dalit, now this is the same story. Adam can be spelt two ways. And the reason Adam can be spelt two ways is because of the two mims. This is a mim 40 and this is a mim 600. And you can pay attention to the mims and notice that this 600 mim is called a final mim and it's more or less like a box with a little doodad up on the top, a little squiggly thing. And this mim 40 is more, like, more or less like our English G that has both these hoops up here. But yet both of them refer to water. And what they refer to are the waters from above and the waters from the below. And the reason it says that, it calls it that, the waters from below are the waters that build the material world. Everything in the material world comes from water. The waters from above are the waters that are electrical, are filled with fire. And, uh, and I'll, sh I'll show you that here. Just look at it. So, Either way is correct, and either way is the spelling of Adam. It's, the, it's not a man, it's not the name, but I'll show you what it is. Either way is correct, different means. Different mims represent two disparate aspects of our being. The physical, which is this. This represents the physical. 40, every time you see the number 40, you remember the number 40 <clears throat> all through Scripture. Moses went up on the mountain for what, 40 days? Jesus went out in the wilderness for what, 40 days? You see this number over and over and over. And always, it always represents the tension of the natural world. You can call it trials and tests. Most people associate it in trials and tests because remember when Jesus was out in the wilderness for 40 days, you remember what it says? And he was what? 
tempted, tempted of the devil. <coughs> the word tempted comes from the Latin tempus, which comes from the root tempo, which actually means time. And all it means is when you see the word, you all, all have heard of Eve being tempted in the garden. Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. We hear all these stories and we think of being lured, <clears throat> being seduced, being tricked. Well, why in the world would God want to lure, seduce, or trick you into anything? <clears throat> Is that not ridiculous? We think that. But it's not true. Actually, it means you are in time. The word, the Garden of Eden. Eden, the word Eden in Hebrew actually means time. You're in the Garden of Time. I, I wish I could make this the way I see it, the way I feel it. You're in the paradise. You are in heaven. You are heaven. And we uh, think it's a place that we're going to get to go to. Someday I'm going to find paradise. Someday I'm going to heaven. You are it. If you could just realize and recognize, you are it. You create your hell, you create your heaven. You are the place you want to go to. How can you go to somewhere that you are already at? You mentioned the 40s and you mentioned Moses. <coughs> and I don't grasp all of this yet, but Moses' life was divided into three 40s. He lived to 120 years old. And if you follow the story, the, the 40 years before he was pushed out of Egypt, the 40 years he was out as a shepherd, the 40 years after he came and freed the Jews, yeah. his life was divided into three 40s. Exactly. There are 40 segments. Exactly. And every one of those segments in his life represents different things in your life. You have to come back to grip with this. You've got to grab hold of it. All of the Old Testament stories are allegories. They aren't historical characters. However, to, to draw an allegory or to paint a beautiful picture, you can draw off a literal character and build an allegory around that character. So I'm not saying there wasn't a person named David, but David is an allegorical character. I'm not saying there wasn't a person named Solomon, even though they have no historical relevance for any of these characters. I'm saying Solomon is an allegory. And if we can see it as an allegory, then I can see the picture of it in my life because it's all about me. It's all about you. It's all about each one of us. So, but it, there again, it, it has to come to a place where we can, we can recognize things. In other words, we have to go back and see it again. Not the way we've been told because the way we've been told is not true. We have to go back and see it for how it was written and meant to be. Is it possible that the, third, the three with Moses is the flesh, the spirit, and the soul? I, I, would, I would say it always comes back to that, yeah. I would say it always comes back to that because that's the marriage, that's the union, that's always the three. It always comes back to that. And that, that again, is something that we all aren't taught that much about. That's the only problem. Just We're just not, there are no problems, really. There is the lack of good information. That's all there is. There is the lack of instructions. You don't do something wrong. You may not do something right, but that, that ain't wrong. You did it the way you did it because you didn't know how to did it. Right? If you'd have been given instruction to do it different, you would have done it different, or you would have done it, what you say, the right way. But you did it the way where you would learn that that way don't work. That's a quote from Maya Angelou. She says that when, that do the best you can until you know better, and when you know better, then do better. I like that. That's good. <clears throat> okay, so the different mims, the physical is, is represented by the, this mim. Now this one is the one we know very little about. This is the physical. You're, not, you're very familiar with the physical body. It tells you what to do every day, don't it? <laughs> every day. It tells you what to do. It tells you what to eat, what to do, when to get up, where to go. It costs it. And you get in tune with it. We pretty well, are, we pretty well obey it, whatever it's calling for, whatever it's asking for. But now this mem. What in the world is this mem? This mem is your mind. This mem deals with your psychology. This mem, this mem deals with the way you think or don't think. This mem deals with that that you're either taught or not taught. 
This is where the rubber meets the road. This is the one where all of the, you call them problems, but I would call them situations or circumstances, this is where they're all at in lack of information. This is where you get information or you don't have any information. This MM represents your psychological being. That's the one that we really have to work on. This is your suki, your soul, your psyche, your et cetera, you name it, you name it. We're either taught or we're not taught. It's just that simple. We either know or we don't know. It's just that simple. How do we get to know? Generally, it's through correct instructions or right information. So that 600 mm, it actually represents the psychological or the electrical fire mind. Isn't that what happens to your brain? Your brain is just an organ that's stimulated by your mind, which is not your brain, but your mind stimulates your or, or your, the organ called your brain to give you a thought. Right? And what happens when you have a thought? You have an electrical storm in your mind or in your brain. Now your brain is constantly like an electrical storm. Y'all have all seen that. If you haven't, just Google it. It'll show you a picture of your brain and all of it. Why? Because your brain is doing literally millions of things at one time. Because it's like the central headquarter of your physical body. So it's telling your bladder when to blad. It's telling your kidney when to kid. And, all the other things telling you eyeball when to look and duck. Your brain is doing all, but your brain is also responding to your mind, which is all the aura around your physical body. So it, it's it's a very important organ in the body, but that's exactly what it is, an organ in the body, but it is the organ that's connected to this aspect of your life. So here's one life and here's another life. So these are the lives that you're living. You're living your physical life, which is dominant. Sad to say, in all of us. And, you, and your psychological or your mind or your thought life, it's not as, it's not as uh, dominant as the physical. Most belief systems refer to the spirit or the soul or, in other words, the divine agent God as the seed of God in the material, the manifest world. I want to emphasize that. The soul is emphasized as the seed of God. You, you know the seed. When I'm talking about a seed, I'm talking about in a seed, apple seed, human seed, pear seed, you name the seed. In the seed is all of the information to build that which that seed represents. Right? Yes. In a human seed is all of the information in that seed to build that body, period. So that was in the seed of your father. In that seed is light. The, I mean, biological science can tell you, prove to you, show you, without any doubt, within that seed, that semen is light. That's this part right here. But it also has water base. That's this part right here. That's the physical. So you have, you have these two lives going side by side, simultaneously, working together. So the seed of God is deposited in the physical body as the sperm of the father in the womb of the female with its own intelligence or light, that's what it is, to build the human body, male or female, but not to run the body. Here's the catchy part, listen to it. Not to run it, not to rule it, God does not make you do anything that you do. Hmm. Duh. You know what God does? God gives you free choice. Oh, I don't like that. God gives you the free choice to make a decision that you're going to do whatever you're going to do. And here's where that's worked out. That's worked out in your psyche, in your psychological being. That's worked out in your training or your lack of training. That's worked out in your teaching, your education, your discipline, or your lack of it, either way. But yet God doesn't do it. God gives you the ability. God deposits itself in you as light in that ability, but not to run it, not to direct it, not to make choices for you, but to allow you, the human being, the temple, to grow, to develop, to expand 
in its own and as it wants to at its own pace. You want to go slow? Good, go slow. You want to go fast? Good, go fast. You the one that set the pace. God doesn't do that. But you see, we have these ideas that we want God to do that. We want God to make this happen. Don't you? I do. <laughs> I have said, well, God, you need, I'm turning this over to you, God. Now you go do it. And then God says, well, I turned it all over to you. Why don't you go do it? No, uh -uh, let's don't do it that way, God. I want you to do it because you can do it better than I can do it. You're more powerful than I And God says, no, I think I put all my power inside you. You're all powerful. No, I'm not. I mean, I know my weakness, my failures. No, you need to get more into this fire, light aspect of your being and awaken to be who you are designed, who we are designed to be, who God made us to be. And as we do that, and I realize there are, there are plethora of excuses, aren't there? I can come up with all kinds of them for myself and for most of the people that I know of. They're just, they're just so many, so many excuses that we can come up with. This is a little book that... Uh, this is an interpretation of the Emerald Tablet. The Emerald Tablet was rediscovered uh, sometime in the late 1700s. And when it did, some people say it was the rock to unveil traditional Christianity. Because when they found this, the Emerald Tablet, when they found it, it debunked a vast majority of Christianity. A vast majority of literalist Christianity. And so that, like I said, the Emerald Tablet was found somewhere in the late 1700s, the best I can remember. And so this is, a, this is an interpretation or translation by Dorel of the Emerald Tablets. And I have several of these, but this one I wanted to read several things from this particular translation of it. And I'm going to, I'm going to translate some of it from my position of seeing things. And, and I realize my position of seeing things, I'm not saying is the right position. I'm saying that it is a position that I have evolved and grown with in my study and re my research, especially in ancient Hebrew. I had someone ask me, where can I read a book that will help me find the things that, that, uh, that you teach or that you know? And I said, it's not available. There's no book out there to teach you this. I said, I can give you literally dozens of books and you got to read all of them and maybe maybe extract information from here and under there i can't give you a book for this but i can tell you if you listen i would say most likely common sensually it makes sense if you'll pay attention to it otherwise you can try to debunk it say well it's just not in my belief system i know that <laughs> i know that right off the skip y'all i mean like gary tice used to say i know you know things you ain't telling me and i said yeah and i know i ain't telling you little things i know <laughs> well why don't you tell me I said because I like it I like you stay around a little longer oh because <laughs> I ain't going to tell you all those things that I know why because you'll leave it's not that I want you to because I don't I don't want any of these folks that have left the thousands of people that have left I don't want any of them to leave and many of them heard things prematurely because I think it's line upon line precept upon precept because you can't hear above where you are unless you have really gotten yourself in a place I'm hungry and I want to know and if you're not there that's okay it doesn't bother me and that's not a threat or you know <laughs> against me uh, listen to this uh, it says, chosen, chosen was I from the sons of men, taught by the dweller, so that his purposes might be fulfilled. Purposes yet unborn in the womb of time. Long ages I dwelt in the temple, learning ever and yet ever more wisdom, until I too approached the light emitted from the great fire. It taught me, he, the path to amenti. Now the word amenti is used, it's an, it's an Egyptian word, and actually it refers to the realm of the earth. And it's used in many different ways about the realm of the earth. He taught me the path to amenti, the underworld where the great king sits upon his throne of might. Deep I bow in homage before the lords of life and the lords of death, receiving as my gift the key to life. Free was I 
of the halls of Amenti. Bound not by death to the circle of life, far to the stars I journeyed, until space and time became not. not. Then, having drunk deep of the cup of wisdom, I looked into the hearts of men, and there found I greater mysteries and was glad. For only in the search for truth could my soul be stilled and the flame within me quenched. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> I just love it. Anyway, that's, uh, that's his translation of the Bible tablet. Now let me read you something else he said right here. Quickly get past this. It says, He who by progress has grown from darkness lifted himself from the night into the light. Isn't that good? I love that. Now I was read that to you again. He who by progress, that's a here a little, there a little, that's line upon line. Because it takes that generally to draw us out of the beliefs that we have been so indoctrinated with. And we don't even realize how deep that those beliefs are and how they hold on to us like a leech. And at the same time suck the very life out of us the same way a leech does. And it's difficult to pull those things out. I know I found that true in my own life. He who by progress has grown from the darkness lifted himself from the night into the light. Free is he made of the halls of Amenti. Now Amenti in some material is called a prison house. And I think that that is a bad connotation of it. And I'm going to tell you why. And, and you'll find this in a lot of other different literature, old, old ancient literature. Ancient literature will say that the physical body is the prison of the spirit or of the soul. Now, I don't, I don't embrace that idea. Even though I understand what they're trying to say, I would have to say the spirit and the soul is as though it were a prisoner in the physical body, but it's only there as a prisoner just exactly like the ideology of a baby or an infant gets locked in the minds of a body and the body outgrows that infant state, but yet the infant state doesn't grow with the body. See that? What does that mean? That means that you can have a 70-year-old man still acting like a 10-year-old kid. Do you ever know anybody like that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, is there something wrong with that scenario? <clears throat> no. The only thing that's not right about that scenario is the child stayed a child. It never grew because the only way a child cannot be a child, it has to be trained. It has to be taught and it has to be disciplined. If it's not trained, it's not taught, it's not disciplined, it becomes an adult child still untrained, untaught, and undisciplined. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just that it don't work real good. <laughs> hmm. Free is he made of the halls or the prisons of the body, of the earth realm. Free of the flower of life, of light and of light. Guided he then by wisdom and knowledge. See, that's how he got free. He got, got, he got to a point. He began to be guided by wisdom and knowledge. And, it, and knowledge comes, it is the key of everything. Without knowledge, people perish. Without knowledge, people are in captivity. I mean, look at the whole world today. Knowledge is what's suppressing the whole world from being what we are designed to be. That's free human beings, not wearing masks, not subject to any kind of a virus, but knowing that we have within us a satanic system, which is your immune system. I've been thinking about revisiting that whole series I did years and years ago on Satan because the word Satan in Hebrew actually means your immune system, which your immune system is adversarial to any virus in your physical body, and yet your physical body is filled with viruses. It's natural. It's normal. 
But if your immune system is the way that it should be from the time that you're a child until the time that you're 120 year old, it will, it will ward off, it will fight off as Satan does any, ad, any adversary that comes in the physical body. If we would just wake up, but no. The large part of the world are asleep. Guided then by wisdom and knowledge passes from men to the masters of life. Huh, hallelujah. That's what, we, that's what we should long to be. I want to be the master of my life. There he may dwell as one with the masters, free, free, free from the bondages and the darkness of night. Just simply, made, it just simply means I'm free from being ignorant. It's ignorant that imprisons me. I'm, I'm not a prisoner. I may just be a child not trained. And as a child not trained, I seem to be a prisoner. Seated within, the, seated within the flower of radiance, sit. Listen to this. Seated within the flower, sit. You know what this is. That's the stick, man. There it is. That's you. Seated within the flower of radiance, sit the seven lords. There they are, the seven endocrine glands. The seven colors of the rainbow. The seven golden menorah. You name it. The seven vials. The seven churches. The seven bowls. The seven times dipped in it. You name it. At the whole Bible, the seven days. Yawns of creation. It's, that's what Scripture's about. The whole Bible is about this seven character called the stick man called you. It's a, the whole book is about it. It's a book about you. My, a biological book about you. Sit the seven lords from space times above us. Helping and guiding through infinite wisdom the pathway through time of the children of men. Mighty and strange they. Veiled with their power. He's talking about all of these sevens right here. In other words, you when you're running at you're running at full capacity of who you are, all seven of your cylinders are hitting. You are working from your sex organ to the very crown top of your head. You're working on all and all of the aspects of your being. You haven't killed your sexual side and you haven't killed your thinking side. Every bit of it is working perfectly, just exactly like God designed it to work, just like it's supposed to work. Veiled with their power, silent, all-knowing, drawing the life power, different yet one with the children of men, a different and yet one with the children of light. <laughs> Isn't that good? Oh, hallelujah. That's a good book. I like that book. So, Genesis. Now go with me to Genesis. We'll finally get back into the Bible. Boy. All the Bible thumpers. So I always get into the real the Bible thumpers here. Go with me to Genesis chapter 7. Okay, where'd you say to go? I'm sorry. Genesis. Genesis. Genesis chapter 2. Yeah, you can't, you, we can't have a meeting and not go to Genesis. <laughs> Genesis chapter 2. Got to go somewhere in Genesis. Genesis chapter 2. All right. Yeah, you, you can all quote it, but let's look at it and read it. Verse 7. And the Lord God formed. The word formed is the Hebrew word yitzar. It means to fashion or to shape. Man, the word man is this word right here, Adam. Adam, and it actually has so much to do with water. Just like Moses, Moses is drawn up out of the water. Anywhere you see that mem, whether it's the mem 40 or it's the final mem 600, it has to do with water, whether it's physical or whether it's psychological. So it's both. It's both and. And I'll show you this. So here we go. Verse 7. Form man, breathe. Born man of the dust. The word dust is a far. It's a Hebrew word, a far. And actually it means particles of light. It, 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 particles of light. 
But you don't, when you read dust, you don't associate part. What do you mean part? It's like a cloud of light. It's like a, a dust cloud of light. That's exactly what it means. You come from a dust cloud of light. Of light. L-I-G-H-T. Your whole body is made up of light. So, of the dust of water, of the gr word ground, is this word right here. Adam, with this glint on the end of it. Adama. And I would, when they add the hay to the end of this word Adam, Adama, they actually call it, it's the miracle of the water. It's the miracle of the substance of water. And it truly is. It's a miracle substance called water. So that's the Adama. And breathe, Neshama, that's wind, breathe into his nostrils the breath of, you see the word life here? Actually, it should have an S on the end of it. It should be spelled just exactly like that. It's the word Shamayim, and it means lives. So what did the Spirit breathe into man? The breath of lives. So now he has two lives. He has a physical life, and he has a psychological life. Which life gets left behind? Yeah, I bet you've never heard anybody talk what I'm saying. I, I, I doubt that you ever heard this period. Even though you have had some psychological teaching, you've all been through grade school, I hope, <laughs> high school, but college, so, you know, we've all been through it, and I skipped through it myself. Somehow or another got through it. I don't know how I did. But then when I turned 26, I realized how ignorant I was, and so I thought, wow, I need to go back, and I need to work on the psychological side of my life because I am ignorant. <laughs> I mean, I was ignorant to the max. That word, life, is the Hebrew word, lives. Two lives. He's talking about the two lives that you have. And my goodness, how this book unfolds in the rest of chapter 2, and the rest of chapter 3. It is such a beautiful and such an untold story. Why is it such an untold story? And what we've been told is such a lie, and we embrace the lie and had not got a clue about the truth of it. Because the rest of the story is about these two lives and how they are to grow, how they are to mature, how they are to expand. And the one we've left behind actually is the one that is more important than the one we've embraced. The one we've embraced is just physical. We just want to feed it. We want to sleep it. We want to fix it, whatever it wants. We want to... Uh, <laughs> Fill in the blanks, you know. Dear God, and if yours is anything like mine, it is a needy thing. I mean, it's always, it needs something all the time, a fix or, a, or this or that or the other. And, you know, right now, it's screaming for, uh, well, it ain't, ain't hotter for Mexican food today, baby. <laughs> Even though I could go there. I thought maybe cold beer and pizza. <laughs> I'm just a dead man. <coughs> Lives. I mean, you know, the, the, I know that word we, we just so and man became a what? What happened because of these lives? What happened because of these two being being integrated into one? What happened? Man became a what? Living soul. He became a living soul. And we don't even have a clue what the soul is. We've heard soul music, we love soul music. We've heard of soul people and we love soul people. But we ain't got a clue what in the world is a soul. What is the soul? What does the soul do? Why did God even make us a living soul? You know? Uh, and I love soul music. I love soul people. You know? I, I, I think I love my own soul. <laughs> whatever, whatever in the world that it might be. But hold your place. Of course, it's not hard to find that. But hold your place right here to Exodus chapter 10 with me. It's just a second book over there. Genesis and then Exodus chapter 10. Exodus chapter 10 and verse 1. And, and it says, and the verse 1 says, and the Lord said unto Moses, there we go, and this is Moses, Mem, Shem, Hey, Moshe, that's how it's pronounced in Hebrew. And the Lord said unto Moses. So now then God's speaking to this water vessel. Okay? I mean, that's pretty much how we would assume this and assimilate this. And drop down with me to verse 
19. Because we have all of these words, that, and I'm going to add a word to this right here in Hebrew. And the thing about this word, and I want you to notice this word, because it has, this word actually has two mems in it. It has two mems in it. And so uh, the two mems in this particular word uh, we're not that familiar with, sad to say. And then let me see if I can put this other word up here. That's two different words right here. This one, this particular word in Hebrew, Shem Mem Yod Mem, has two mems. So the two mems refer to the two lives. The life from the life from below and the life from above. So it refers to the physical life and it refers to the psychological life. So it refers to your two lives. And this word is grossly misused, completely misunderstood. In everything, I hardly even know anybody knows anything about this particular word. You say, well, what in the hell is this word? It's heaven. That's the word heaven. Shem mem yod mem. Shamayim is the word for heaven. Shem mem yod mem. That's the physical life that's empowered by the breath. The Shem 300 always refers to the breath. The yod mem, yod, yod mem, that's the psychological life. 600 values always referring to the fire, that which is from above. So you have both lives referred to in this one word. And it actually it's used that way in Genesis 1, 7, and 8. But we didn't know that. We didn't even catch on to it. We just got stuck in Genesis 1-1 when it says in the beginning God created heaven. We thought, wow, hey, he worked on that place out there, his home first. No. But that's where we got so distracted with it. But then what about this little word right here? Notice it has both mems in it too. It's got the physical 40 and it's got the psychological 600. Got both men, but what in the world could that little word be? Well, <laughs> that's the Hebrew word water. Water. So you can look at every one of these, you know what all these are word? Every one of them's water words. Whether it's the word Moses, it's a water word. Whether it's the word Adam, spelled both ways, the water word. Whether it's the word heaven. It's a water word, or whether it's the word water. It's a water word. <laughs> so, what are they? They're all words that deal with the material realm and what's happening and what we what we have in this material realm that uh, that we know so very little about. Uh, let me uh, just to kind of cut the chase a little bit shorter because there's so much I want to develop and squeeze out of this especially the soul aspect of it. Uh, let me give you different words for the soul that are the same, synonyms. This is the same word, same identical word in Hebrew. For soul is mind. Same identical word. Same identical word in Hebrew for mind is ego. Same identical word. And I want you to see the catchy part about this. Most of you... Most of you are taught to get rid of your ego because it's not any good. But yet your ego is just exactly like a child or an adult. It's either been trained or untrained. Sad to say, most of us adults haven't been trained properly. That's just all. That's just that way. I mean, I know I have. But that, all of these words, all of these words are the same Hebrew word. Isn't that crazy? Nafesh. Same identical Hebrew word for soul. It's nafesh. Same identical Hebrew word for mind is nafesh. Same identical word for ego in Hebrew is nafesh. Same word. And you know what these words mean? It, they all mean that which thinks, that which feels, that which, that which reasons between conscious and unconscious. That's what those words mean. The same meaning for all three words. And yet many times we look down on the mind. We certainly don't even appreciate the ego because we don't know the part in our life that it plays. But when we have these words 
in an understanding, it begins to change our, our thinking and it begins to change our way of viewing things. I want to read you something here from Alvin Boyd Kuhn in this book, and this is called The Collection of Alvin Boyd Kuhn. Tremendous book, but it nevertheless. It says, an allegory, at any rate, ancient scriptural allegory, was a literary device designed to pictorialize a spiritual uh, reality in man's individual experience. You get it? I'll read that to you again. I think that an allegory. Paul said this, Galatians chapter 4. I, I mean, you go look it up anytime. He said the story of Abraham and Sarah is an allegory. Without question, without doubt. If you're going to make Abraham and Sarah an allegory, you've got to make their parents, their parents, their parents, and their parents allegorical. And you have to make their children and their children after them because Paul says Abraham and Sarah and their children are all an allegory. That means that they are a symbolic story. If we don't know how to read the symbol and the sign in the story, we won't understand. For instance, if I go to Genesis chapter 2 and I realize this is an allegory, what does the woman as an allegorical figure, what does she represent? Now remember, she's an allegory. What does she represent? A woman represents a mother or that which can produce an offspring. And what is the earth called by the American Indian and many other ancient cultures. Mother Earth. Mother Earth. So what does the woman symbolize in Genesis chapter 2? She symbolizes Mother Earth. She symbolizes the place where we come from. Mother Nature. Every one of us. Mother Nature. You, you can just take it on and on. Now you have to put that in your pipe and smoke it and then keep the vision of it. So when I start talking about man and woman, when I talk about the woman, what am I talking about? I'm talking about Mother Earth. I'm talking about that which produces an offspring. Well, when I'm talking about the male, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the seed, the light, that which is impregnates. And we have to put that in. We're not talking about literal people in those stories. We're talking about allegorical stories. And when I see that, I can remember that. Like, oh, okay. An allegory, at any rate, ancient scriptural allegory was a literary device designed to pictorialize spiritual reality in man's individual experience. I, I, that just jumps all over me. I, I would love to say it did you. In the form of earthly physical narratives and fictitious events. Uh, so, we are, we are quite warranted without further demonstration in assuming that the story of the crossing, he's talking about the crossing of the Red Sea, I'll get to that the next time we get together, next week or whatever, in the crossing of the, of the Red Sea is designed to carry its meaning into an area of our individual life to work there a proper miracle of understanding at two higher levels of Philo's scale. As to this, it can be said at once that virtually all scriptural allegories and other Semitic modes of representing <coughs> exalted truth and nominal realities have but one basic theme to comment upon. The incarnation of souls in mortal bodies here on earth. Did you get? In other words, what is the soul? It is the seed of God. What is the mind? It is the seed of God. What is the ego? It is the seed of God. It's not wrong. It's not bad. Now it can be not trained. It can be not disciplined. And when it's not trained and it's not disciplined, it's your worst enemy. It'll take you through all kinds of garbage. <laughs> It'll drag you through this and through that. And it won't just do it once. It'll just do it over and over and over and as long as you and I will let it do it to us. It will just continue. 
So let me read you these notes that I, that I wrote and then we'll just unhook here and hook right back up. The divine seed soul is not in bondage or it's not a prisoner to the human body, but it's like an infant. It's like a child in its body. It longs to be trained and disciplined and especially educated in how to play or how to dance in this arena called the earth and in this game that we call life. The mysteries of the story of water is in the name Adam. It's spelled in two different ways in Hebrew, which I've already put on the board. The first M is 40, which represents the physical. Uh, that out of my way. And, and the contrast, and the contrast, the first one represents the physical, in contrast with the second, which represents the fire or spirit that's in the physical natural world. Thus we see the types of 40, the types of 40s in scripture, just like this word here, Adam, that's what I'm referring to when I say that. We see the types of 40 in scriptures. The next meal, the 600, is the meal final. This exalts or carries the psychological into the higher dimensions of consciousness or spirit. There for the light, L-I-G-H-T, the light of your lives. That's its importance. So we talk about these soul, mind, and ego. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about how important that the light, you don't understand what I'm talking about? When I talk about light, I'm talking about the unveiling of truth, the information that we get and we assimilate. How important that light is. So we'll just, uh, we're going to stick, disconnect there. And come back to this. I've been on water so much today, and it just now the Tao Te Ching came to me. Has a verse that talks about the fact that water is so flexible, yet it can carve canyons. Reuben. Reuben's the firstborn of Jacob. His name means to see. And yet, that's in Genesis chapter, I think, 20, 29 or 30, 31. Yet in Genesis chapter 40, 41, when Jacob is, is dying, he calls all 12 of his boys in there. And he calls Reuben in first. And he said, Reuben, you will not excel because. Now he could see, but here's what he said. You will not excel because you're like water. And water is very unstable. That's this. What does it need? It needs the assistance. It needs the aid of the training and the discipline of the psychological side of fire in the water. The spirit in it. If you learn what it is, though, look what it can do. Exactly. Look what it can do when we feel. And you see, all these stories, allegories, are there to awaken these realities individually in each one of us. And when we can take them and embrace them and personalize them and realize this is the story about me. Hallelujah. And now I am at the business of awakening. <clears throat> and I'm being stirred to awakening. I'm not doing this to me. It's being done to me. I'm being drugged to me. <laughs>